<laughs> One other question on the chronically infected or chronic infection or chronic abscess yeah. on a mature tooth. Do you ever find that the root tip, the apex, is somewhat widened? Okay, where's the endodontist? We're going to get this more interactive. Well, I don't, I don't find a widened apical foramen. I want, I want one of you guys to answer his question just for fun, because Ruddle is not, uh, you know, you got a Ruddle break. So why don't you, you guys take a shot? He, so his question was, in necrotic cases, you're thinking sometimes you have a, a bigger foramen or some reversed architecture? Yes. Okay. Yeah, it has some yeah. apical root resorption. Yeah. yeah. Uh, yeah. Resorption. So dive in, you end Adonis. Tell him what you're thinking. I, I, I'm of course, I'll go last because I'm the truth. I saw a case today <laughs> that was a, a number 29. It had a long-term uh, abscess. It had uh, apical resorption and a widened mm -hmm. apical access mm -hmm. on the radiograph. Mm -hmm. How do you feel about restoring that? You mean, I mean, endodontically? You don't yes. mean... Okay, who's another endodontist? Tell, how, okay. J John, right? Yeah, right. So, John, how would you handle the, how big is this foramen roughly? I mean, give them a, give them a little mental picture. Um, they don't always, a mental picture out of the digital x-ray, I guess. A, well, if you throw well, an instrument in, forget file, the file, if you throw a file in there, is this thing like an 80, is it a 100, is it a 60? No, it'll be more like a 35 to yeah, 40. That's all right. Go ahead. Well, you just get your taper and you just seal it. I mean... Okay, what he said was, because he's, he, he's uh, embarrassed, but he, he gave the right answer. You're the foramen, so make a circle. Okay, and you can make it ir irregular or whatever. What he just told you was you need to get shape or taper behind your foramen. Because if you have four things in place, there's no force on the planet to move gutta percha through the foramen. You have to have shape. But there's, you could break that down into a continuous tapering preparation, maintain the original anatomy, maintain the position of the frame, and, and then keep the frame as small as practical. That's shape. The next thing you have to have in place is cone fit, if we're doing a classic cone fit. So you can't have skid marks up in the body of your cone. You've got to seat that cone, lift it up, seat it, lift it up. And then when you pull it out, look for little indentations, striations, and scratches right in the terminal part of the cone. And then you're thinking the cone is engaging where I think it is. So short, crisp, tug back. When you pull it out, it's not like, uh, 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 boom. That's long tug back, and that's not good. So if you have shape, if you have cone fit, if you keep your heat source back five millimeters, keep your pluggers back five millimeters, there's no force on the planet to move GP through. Because when you have shape and the GP gets thermal softened, we only have to go three degrees above body temperature, 37, gutta percha becomes moldable. The gutta percha will, will grab those lateral walls that you just shaped, and that prevents the gutta percha or it encourages it not to go through. So, it, so he's, 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 see, he's right. really comfortable with a, a 30, a 40, a 50. Now the caveat is at some point if we take this conversation further, let's just say for fun it's a 60. And then we could say let's take it to an 80. Well now I want you to look at the root. Because if you're going to try to get taper behind the frame and blow out the root, then you're going to have invite a longitudinal fracture. So at some point, He's going to say to us, and I know he knows, he's just going to be quiet because he thinks I'm supposed to leave, but I'm thinking <laughs> he should leave. But I know how he trained and where he trained, and he'll tell you you need a barrier. Mm -hmm. And at some point he's going to say, you know, I don't want to try to get taper, now make a bigger one. I don't want to try to do this because he's looking at his root, bulk and form, he's looking for external concavities, and he's thinking if I keep running my taper out, and, and when I say taper, it doesn't have to go through the, to the orifice, it just needs to have about five millimeter zone of really nice deep shape and then you can be a little bit more conservative but at some point he's going to look at the root, the bulk and form, external concavities and he's going to weigh everything, risk versus benefit, he's going to go I can't get taper behind the foramen, I'm going to blow out the root. I'm going to need MTA and get a barrier down there to pack against. That's what he would tell you. In the nature of the two structure? Is it going to be diseased, or is it going to, what, the long term, I don't know if I have ge geographical successes. Dive in, John. Well, he's thinking on the external root surface and stuff, if it's all pitted and infected and all that, by sealing just the, to the foramen, is the rest of that going to all heal? I think that's his question that's and stuff. Oh, so you're talking more about external. Yeah. Is that what you're saying, external? I refer those You're to all John. <laughs> I don't know. I don't deal with externals. I, that's a, I limit my practice to central incisors that are chronic. <laughs> I don't want to see bleeding. No, go ahead. Well, I mean, 
you got to do what you got to do. I just try and, you know, you see how it works out. I assume most of those cases are going to heal. Some of it depends upon the age of the person, it seems to me. I mean, you have somebody that's very old and that thing's been there for a long time. I think that the healing potential goes down. If you have some young kid or something like that, then usually those things heal up pretty quick. I see, mean, we could get into a whole discussion, but now we can get into resorption. Yeah. And there's, you know, inflammatory resorption, there's replacement resorption. You know, like you put, percuss the tooth and it sounds like a bell ringing because there's no PDL space. So that tooth's a goner, but they might have it for several years, so it could be a good space maintainer. But if we have external resorption, there's pocketing normal, it's mobile, I mean, mobility is good, then what was the cause of that? And I think he's going to want to know, you know, was this secondary to trauma as an example, or was it just a pulp that became necrotic? and then through tubular leakage, all these things start happening. So I would take the pulp out, and I might use calcium hydroxide in there for quite a while. I'm not very quick on those cases. I don't care if it sits for six months. So I would see them at three months and just take a film on a recall. If I can still see my calcium hydroxide in there, bye-bye. But if it's washed out, I'll replenish it. But we've all done mm -hmm. probably thousands of those cases, and the vast majority do work. Well, yeah. Just like when we were kids in school, we learned that you know, about half of them were cysts and about half of them were granulomas. But then we were trained that cysts didn't heal as well. But in clinical practice, almost all this heals, heals so I'm not thinking they're all cysts, or 50% are cysts. So it gets back to what caused the problem, the etiology. And I would shape the canal ideally. I'd go with a, a interim calcium hydroxide. The pH is about 12. Most of your inflammatory reactions, the pH is very acidic. So the idea is you can get that hydroxyl ion out there and it can stabilize or rest up. But getting the pulp out would be our major goal if that was the etiology. Now, if he takes the pulp out and the thing keeps melting down, that was not the cause. Do you understand? In other words, what do you mean? The, the, well, I mean, sometimes Ruddle's gone in and taken, like you see a patient, there's like this very case you're describing. So there's some moth-eaten external resorption. And maybe it's a virgin tooth. So I don't even have like multiple episodes of dentistry you know, every episode is a little kick in the sea of the pants for the pulp. Right. So at some point, the pulp goes over the hill. So if you have a virgin tooth, you're thinking, well, it didn't have a history of caries, didn't have a history of multiple dental procedures. What happened? Well, I'm thinking there's trauma. Well, then I'm not, I'm a little bit less clear. Well, of course, you check the vitality. And if it's necrotic, permission to play with high confidence. But what if it tests normal limits to, uh, to the adjacent or contralateral opposing teeth? I'm not knowing that my root canal is going to necessarily arrest this. I believe it. And so then you got to really talk to the patient about, you know, we could go in here and take out your pulp and spend some time and some money, and that resorption might progress. How do you feel about that? Oh, that can't happen to me. Well, then, sorry, I can't help you. Because at some point, you're, it's, you don't know. And some people say, I want to do everything I can. So you can help those maybe, maybe you can't. Does that clear that up a little bit? I think so. So external resorption mainly is you want to do your pulp testing. And does that make sense? Because we want to know why we're doing something. So you want to have a reason. So do your pulp testing. And if it's necrotic, I think it's fine. If it has a very severe and prolonged response to cold, that's what we used to say is hyperemic. That's an inflamed pulp. So I, I have more confidence to play in those. But if I just get this boring response to cold, and I know they didn't fool me, they fit, you know, because we do some blind shit, you know, we'll put on the gum, you feel it. Oh yeah, I feel it. Well, they don't feel it in the tooth. So you get them, you got to do some contralateral teeth first, some opposing teeth, and then once you lock them in to the immediacy, the intensity, and the duration of the response, they get really locked in. So they don't fool you and you don't fool them. And if you get a tooth that's testing pretty normal, and I see the same thing you just described, I'm not so comfortable that my result, my procedure is going to help.